Hi everyone, this is Yelena from Amazonia PPC, and today I have a very special guest with me, um, Nathan Hirsch. He, is, he was the founder of WeUp Platform and also now the founder of Outsource School. Nathan, welcome to our podcast and thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, lately, I know that there have been some initiatives to uh, build the Outsource School. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it is and who is it for? Yeah, well, I was a long time Amazon seller. I did that for six, seven years, and I eventually built the free up marketplace based on my own frustrations uh, using virtual assistants and freelancers and going to Upwork or Fiverr and getting 100 applicants and having to vet them myself and go through one by one. By one. And I just wanted a better experience. So I spent the past four years building up the free up marketplace. We started it with $5,000, a platform that um, we would vet VAs and freelancers before letting them in and make them available to clients quickly. A lot of Amazon sellers, marketing agencies, Amazon agencies. And then on the back end, we would protect them with great support and a no turnover guarantee if, if someone quit. So we scaled that from $5,000 to eventually doing over $10 million a year. We were acquired 100 days ago. And throughout the past four years, mm -hmm. people have been asking me to launch a course on using VAs. And I just really haven't had the time to do it because I've been focused on free up. So now that, that I'm no longer a part of free up and we finished the transition, we want to launch an education platform. We want to teach everyone everything we really know about virtual assistants. And it all starts with our first course, our IOTA method, which is interviewing, onboarding, training, managing IOTL, IOTM. And that's going to be the first course off of that. If people like it, we have a lot of ideas for different mini courses and um, even some software that, that we want to build that, that'll help people use virtual assistants. So it's all around the idea of really helping people use virtual assistants. And we really love the Philippines and VAs in the Philippines. And we're even partnering with Teach for the Philippines, to, which is all about providing Filipino children with more education to help them become virtual assistants or, or get jobs and other opportunities. So it all kind of goes full circle. And we feel like it's our way to, to really give back to the community. Sounds brilliant. And also, I really like the fact that you have based your uh, sourcing of VAs just from one country. What is your experience with the uh, Philippine um, in terms of uh, cultural differences? Yeah, well, the free marketplace was about 40, 50 percent Philippines. So it wasn't all Philippines, but we obviously like like the Philippines a lot. And I have a great relationship with, with a lot of Filipino virtual assistants. I mean, they're hardworking. They, they speak English at a high level. They, they have a sense of family and, and team culture, which I think is really important, especially if you want to keep virtual assistants around for a long period of time. After you invest all this time, money, and energy into them, you want them to work for you for, for years to come. Obviously, price point is a factor. Minimum wage in the Philippines is $12 a day, so it's not that hard to, to beat that. And I had VAs that, that we were paying over 20 plus an hour and, and we increased the rate over time. And when we sold free up, we, we took hundreds of thousands of dollars and gave it to our team in the Philippines to, to thank them for all their hard work. So just because you can hire them cheap doesn't mean you necessarily have to and, and that you can't treat them well. But there's a lot of great cultural things like speaking. English and the fact that they're tech savvy and they consume the, the same media that we do in terms of video games, uh, movies, and, and music and stuff like that that helps you, especially if you're a product based business, hiring people that, that actually understand or potentially understand your products. That's super important. Um, talking about outsourcing, how do you know what to outsource? Which parts of uh, your business you can delegate to someone else safely and which parts you absolutely must do yourself? Yeah, so I like to focus on what I'm good at. I, I think most entrepreneurs are, are only good at one to three things. If you're an Amazon seller, maybe you're good at writing listings. Maybe you're good at sourcing products, but figure out what you're the best at and create a list of all the other stuff and how many hours a week you're spending on it. And also you can order it by what you like doing the least versus the most, but I tend mm -hmm. to do it by how do I get the most time back? Hey, if this task is taking me five hours a week, what would I do with an extra five hours? How can I delegate that? And I encourage entrepreneurs to, to create a 90 day rule where you're not doing any task outside of your core competency longer than 90 days. For the first 90 days, you're, mm -hmm. you're figuring it out. You're throwing stuff against the wall for the second month. Maybe you're, you have a good idea of what works and what doesn't work and you're fine tuning that SOP and maybe you're hiring that VA. And then you're spending the last month 
onboarding the VA and training them and getting them to really take over the task, giving them feedback so that at the end of 90 days, you're not doing that task anymore. And if you can consistently do that over and over in your business, you're going to be able to really focus on the high level stuff. Right. That's right. And also one of the main ideas I had was to find something that is repetitive uh, as, as long as it's also time consuming. If you see something repeating over and over again, there must be some potential to like uh, shape that in a, like a procedure and just outsource it, let it, let someone else take care of that. Um, yes. Yeah, I, repetitive is great. And it's a perfect place to start, especially if you've never hired a VA before. I think as you get better and better at hiring VAs, you can give them more advanced tasks. I'll, I'll give them ownership of, hey, you're in charge of the customer service team. You're in charge of the billing team, whatever applies for, for your business. And you can have people prove themselves by giving them ownership of small tasks, have them make those tasks better and better and eventually make them team leaders. And who knows? I, some of my best ideas, best feedback has come from VAs because I gave them more than just the repetitive tasks. Mm -hmm. So it's not just uh, task outsourcing, but also giving them ownership of, over the parts that they're in charge of. Yeah, exactly. What are some of the immediate disqualifiers for a candidate when you're doing like an interview, something that will be immediately repulsive or you just know it's not going to work? The red flags. So what we preach is doing an interview via chat. You can do it on Skype, you can do it on Slack or Google Hangouts, whatever you want to do. And we, we actually are recording this week how to interview a VA and actually interviewing VAs for our course. And the thing that is the biggest red flag for us is response time. If we're asking mm -hmm. questions, it's taking four minutes, six minutes, five minutes to, to get a response, th that's a huge red flag for us. We want to work with someone who we can keep going and, and make progress and quickly get through an interview, get through the onboarding and get them started because that only leads to delays down the line, whether it's their internet or it's distractions or they're just a slow typer, whatever it is, any of those things are, are big red flags. Another red flag for me is people, people that their motivation isn't the actual work or isn't actually the, the culture or being a part of the business. People where their motivation is money. How do I make more money? And they're not a graphic designer because they love doing graphic design. They're not a virtual assistant because they want to be a part of something great and grow with the business. They really just care about money at the end of the day. And the second someone offers them more money, they're out the door. So those are two that, that we kind of look for up front. But as you're going through the interview process, different red flags will pop up. And it's your job as a business owner to dig a little bit deeper. Let's say, for example, they, they live in a rural area that has a lot of power in, power outages. Well, you need to dig deeper. What's the backup plan? Do they have a backup generator? Do they have a friend's house they can go to? So not every red flag is, oh my God, if I see this, I can't hire this person. Sometimes you just need to dig more, dig deeper and get more information. Interesting. And um, talking about the communication response times, does the time difference uh, show as a big problem? So no, the time difference has never really been a problem because we know what we're looking for up front. If we need someone nine to five Eastern time, we're only going to hire someone that we know is good working nine to five Eastern time that has worked the graveyard shift before. If we're hiring someone flex schedule, we have a set, a meetup point. So, Hey, your flex schedule, I don't care when you do the work, but check in me, with me every day at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So there are ways to, to go around it. The, the way that I like to tell people is, First of all, make sure that the VA is really good with the schedule. That might mean asking them two or three times and, and really making sure they're good with it. And second, avoid anything that's on call and urgent. On call and urgent doesn't exist. Having a VA that just sits at their computer waiting for you to send them work and they just get to it right away, that might work for a day or maybe it's a new VA that is trying it out for the first time, but that's not going to last. That's not a good way to run your business. You either need some kind of set schedule, you need to do it project-based by milestones, or you can do flexible schedule, but with check-in points. If you have on-call work, and I have a lot of on-call VAs for different things, I reach out to them and I say, hey, are you available? And if they are, then we set up a due date. So really on-call is project-based. It's never on-call and urgent. Right. Uh, so talking about those expectations, how do you set expectations uh, in terms of deliverables or time or due dates, like you mentioned? Yeah. So I always like to set not only a due date, but a due time as well. It's not due next Tuesday. It's due next Tuesday at 2 PM Eastern time. And mm -hmm. you can set in milestones, even if it's a small project, let's say it's a, 
four day project that you're having them do, you can say, hey, at the end of the second day, send me what you have so far so that I can give you feedback so I can point you back in the right direction. So setting up that due date, due time, and those milestones, those check-in points, incredibly important. And start small and get bigger. Let's say you have a virtual assistant that needs to optimize 50 Amazon listings. Don't just give them 50 listings. Give them one, have them send it back to you, give them feedback, give them two more, have them send it back to you, and then build up from there. And what happens is if you do it small and work your way up, you end up building a Rolodex of VAs and freelancers that you can rely on that you don't have to do that in the future. You can say, hey, I'm going to send this to Bob. He's good at listings. I'm going to send this to, to Joe. He's good at graph design. And you know what you're going to get. Exactly. Um, in terms of uh, time deliverables, how do you react if uh, a virtual assistant is a little slower than what was expected or you know is realistic in terms of deliverables? Yeah. So for me, it's all about communication. And I was going through this with these video editors I just hired for our course and they, they're all, they've been doing an awesome job. But that first day I was like, Hey, give me an estimate. Let's say you say four hours. If it's going to take you more than four hours, that's fine. But don't tell me at the end that, Oh my God, I just used up the four hours. I need two more. If you get to hour two or hour three and you think it's going to take you more time, communicate it then. And then we can make a decision from there. And Obviously, if, if someone's really, really slow, you can always make a move and get someone faster. But what I like to do is break it down and find out what is the cause of you being slow? Is it your internet? Is it a computer? Or usually, if you break it down, it's one particular thing, one step that they're being held up on. If you have an SOP, a standard operating procedure that's five steps long, I'll go through it and I'll say, hey, how long is step one taking? How long is step two taking? How long is step three taking? And let's say they say, oh, step three is taking me an hour and a half. And in my head, I'm thinking, what? That It's a 20 minute task. Then I'll go even deeper into step three. All right, walk me through why it's taking so long. And maybe it's one or two things that they're not understanding or they're not doing it the right way, or you have a faster way that you can teach them. And that's usually a much better way to get someone to work faster. So the key would be frequent and quality, high quality communication and having your SOPs in place. Definitely. Yeah. And being able to break it down deeper than, oh, my VA is slow. Figure right. out where, what part of the SOP they're actually slow at. Yeah. That might even lead you to some good conclusions that will improve your SOPs as well. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, in terms of price per hour, for example, how do you determine how much, um, uh, how do you negotiate the prices and what are some of the flaws of hiring some some of the most cheap, cheapest work? So a typical VA in the Philippines, I recommend paying between five and 10 bucks an hour. And the <laughs> real key for me is if I'm going to hire someone, let's say my budget's five bucks an hour, I want to make sure the person I'm hiring wants to work at five bucks an hour. If they really want six, that's fine. I'll go find someone else that wants five. Now you can lowball, you can negotiate, but there's some risk involved and I do it because I'm a little bit more advanced. I've hired a lot of VAs and I usually, maybe I'll start with a trial period. Okay. You want five for the first 30 days. We'll do it at four and then we'll bump you up to five. Or what I did with Marius at free up is he wanted five. I said, Hey, let's start you off at three, but I'm going to increase your rate every time build hours goes up by 500. So I eventually made him a team leader and his pay went up and he eventually was making over $15 an hour. So there's different creative ways you can go about starting off at a low rate. You just have to be okay with the risk. That hiring Marius for three bucks an hour, that could have backfired on me, right? He could have right. quit after a week because someone else offered him more money and I have to be okay with that risk. So if you want to play the, the safe bet, make sure you hire people that are happy with the rate that, that you're willing to offer. And if you do low ball or you do offer a training period or you do offer, hey, I'm going to give you a raise in six months, make sure that you honor your word and that you're actually doing those things or the chance of losing them goes up even higher. Mm -hmm. Aside from losing them, are there any other risks of involved, that are involved uh, in cheaping, hiring the cheapest workers? Yeah, I mean, it depends who you hire more than how you pay them. I, I've hired cheap people that have been great. And I told them, for example, hey, I have a lead generation task. It's a flexible schedule. It's really low stress. I'm going to teach you how to do it. It's really easy. I'm not going to give you additional tasks. And But this is the rate, and the rate's not going to go up. And is that what you're looking for? Are you okay with that? And I spent a little extra time making sure that they were okay with that. And that was perfect. 
I've had other people that I hired for a low rate and, and they really weren't skilled enough to, to even do that task. So I think it has more to do with their experience and why they, they're okay with such a low rate. Maybe they're good with the outside stuff, the flexibility, the ability to work from home, the, the, the easiness of the job so that they don't have to stress out and that they can focus on their family, whatever it is. Or it could be that they're a new virtual assistant and, and this is an entry rate and they're going to be looking to increase their rates later, which could lead to turnover. So you really need to get the full picture of, hey, this person's okay at four bucks an hour, but do they just need a job right now or are they okay, really okay with four bucks an hour long term? Which leads us back to communication. You have to communicate the, those things really, really well and like go into all these details. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about diversification of your online workers? What does it mean? Why is it so important and how to do it? Yeah, so I had a situation with my Amazon business where I hired one person to be the manager of the day. I taught him how to list products, how to do customer service, how to do repricing. This was before Amazon software even existed. So it was very, very manual. And on the flip side, I had this one manufacturer who I was crushing it with. And I said, you know what? I don't care about the other manufacturers. Let's focus on them. So I get my business to a really good place. I think it's money's coming in. I have one person running everything. I'm sleeping better at night. I'm not as stressed out. I got this one manufacturer. We're crushing it with them, making good margins. And I go on vacation. And on the first day of my vacation, my manager quits on me and my manufacturer drops me. So I learned a very valuable lesson about diversification. And when I came back, I started contacting lots of different manufacturers and built relationships with hundreds of them. And it wouldn't be the last manufacturer that dropped me, but the next time it wasn't that big of a deal. And when it became time to hire again, I diversified and divided up between teams or departments. So I hired two VAs for customer service, one person for listing prices or for listing products, one, two people for repricing. And next time someone quit on me, it wasn't that big of a deal. I would just plug someone into that specific team. It would only take me a few hours or days or weeks to train them instead of six months. And it's a much better way to run your business. And I see a lot of entrepreneurs fall into this trap where hiring's hard. You make a few bad hires, you finally hire someone you like, and then you just load that person up with everything because you really like working with them and people don't realize how risky that really makes your business. Right, putting all the eggs in one basket. <laughs> um, so when it comes to building a team culture with uh, online workers with a remote team, how do you go about that? And how do you find out what your uh, online workers care most about? So we call it our BARF method, which is kind of a, a funny mm -hmm. acronym, but it stands for getting them to buy in, showing appreciation, building relationships, and creating a family culture. So getting them to buy in is stuff like telling them why you started the business, what's your motivation behind it, how hard did you work to create it, how, what the work that they're doing, how that actually contributes to the big picture. So making them feel a part of the business. Showing appreciation is super easy. Thanking them for a hard day's work or a great week at the end of the week or when you accomplish something and a project is done, telling them what a great job they did. Building relationship is more one-on-one, -on -one, getting to know them, sharing about you, the food you like, how you travel. You can visit them in person if you want to go to the extreme, but you can just learn about them, their family, their personal life, a little bit outside of work. And building the family is getting everyone on your team to like each other and want to hang out together. And, and we've sponsored meetups and different events there, but you can also do it during your meetings, ask people to share stuff at their meetings about them and, and build those relationships. Because if people feel like your business is their family, they're going to be less likely to leave, even if they get a higher paying job offer. So if you can get people to buy in, if you show appreciation, if you build relationships and you build that family, you, the percentage of turnover drastically goes down and you're going to build a, a really good culture. That's really great. Especially if you have people that you really care about uh, leaving in your team that you want long-term. So um, one part of that communication of understanding what it really matters to them is getting their ideas and feedback from them. So do you have any advice for best practices to do that? Yeah. <laughs> so Sometimes people in the Philippines can be a little bit shy and you need to ask people <laughs> questions more than once. So we'll tell them that during the interview, we'll tell them that during the onboarding and we'll make it clear during meetings where we'll ask for feedback. Now, 
when you do ask for feedback, you're going to get good ideas. You're going to get bad ideas. You're going to get some ideas that they might make sense to the VA, but the VA doesn't have the full picture to know why that would or wouldn't work. So you have to be very careful on how you accept the feedback. If you say, we love feedback, we love feedback, we love feedback, and someone gives you feedback and you shoot it down right away, they're mm -hmm. probably not going to give you more feedback. So it's a full process. It takes a little bit of convincing. It takes a little bit of making them feel comfortable, like no idea is a bad idea, and, and you want their feedback and ideas. And sometimes you have to go the extra effort and say, hey, that seems like a really good idea. Let me explain to you why I don't think that'll work. And then you can let me know what you think once you have the full information. So it, it's a long-term play. It's not a short-term play. And I also like to tell people, hey, you don't have to come in and give me feedback and ideas on day one. Learn what we have so far. The SOPs I teach you isn't that way because Nate said so. It's, be, it's that way because this is what we've built so far. We're on the same side. Now let's make it better. Let's try to improve everything and, and keep getting better over time. And when you set that mentality over, over when you set the mentality, mentality early on and you continue to do it over and over and over again, you're going to get VAs that feel comfortable with you that continue to send you really good feedback. Interesting. Um, so keeping that in mind that you have to build those SOPs, that's like number one important thing. You really need to understand your processes and your procedures and everything and break it, break them down into details. So uh, that being said, uh, do you have like some really good advice on how to build those? And because I know for sure that you shouldn't let at least you shouldn't let um, even one day go by without building assets for your business. So SOPs are one big part of those assets. So what can you share with us regarding SOPs? Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that, that made free up acquirable because when they were going through their due diligence, the Hoth who, who bought us, they were asking, hey, what's your process for this? What's your process for this? And we had everything documented very clear where someone who maybe didn't understand the, the business could understand how to do it. So I like to break SOPs into three parts. Now, everyone knows the middle part, right? It's the steps. Do step one, step two, step three, step four. That part's a given. The two parts that people mess up are the top and the bottom. The top, you have to give a background. You have to give a why. You can give a background on your business. You can give a background on the task why they're doing the task, what success, what failure looks like. I'll even put in Marius, for example, my bookkeeper. I had, I had fired the two bookkeepers before him. So I put in there, not their names, but I said, hey, the two bookkeepers before you didn't work out because of X, Y, Z. This is what I'm looking for. So before he even got to the steps, he got to see what the business was, why, he, why bookkeeping and billing is so important, and what I'm looking for, what success and what's failure. Then he went through the steps and then at the bottom, I put in the really important things. It could be, hey, don't email seller support or seller performance for any reason without my approval. It could be, hey, if my lawyer or accountant shoots me an email, make sure you tell me. Don't respond to that. But don't have the important parts just buried in your steps. Have a little reminder at the bottom of all the really important things that they should or should not do. So if you break down your SOPs like that, the why, the steps, the, the do not do list, you're going to have a much better success rate getting people to really understand your trainings. Interesting. A lot of entrepreneurs don't find uh, that super important because they have a lot of things on their plate. But once you outsource stuff, you get uh, your focus to the right, um, in the right place and start building those assets, which is super important. Right. Um, um, thank you for being our guest on our podcast today. Do you have anything else like a, Top one advice related to outsourcing that you'd like to share with our listeners. Yeah, don't give up. I mean, no one has a 100% hiring record. That The key is to figure out a way to get into that 70 to 90%, where 70 to 90% of your hires are A-plus players with really good culture that, that help your business. And entrepreneurs that are just stuck in that 20 to 40%, they're going to struggle. They're going to go in circles. And anything you can do to improve your hiring process is going to help you. We also have a free VA calculator. If you go to outsourceschool.com slash VA calculator, which will tell you, you'll plug in information on your business, how many full-time and part-time virtual assistants you can afford, which will give you a really good parameters on what you can hire and what you can really take off your plate. One last question. Um, do you have any book recommendations for business owners? 
Yeah. Check out Hatching Twitter. I actually just finished that book. Fantastic book. You kind of get a, a behind the scenes of the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to, to growing a business from an idea to an IPO. And it's just fascinating for people starting off at friends as friends and, and really backstabbing each other. And, and it's a big power grab. So very fascinating book for anyone that, that loves entrepreneurship. Thank you very much, Nathan, for being my guest today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Great.